we begin today's show in Mexico, where a wave of murders of journalists in the last two weeks prompted reporters and their supporters to take to the streets and protest nationwide Tuesday. I'm here with a lot of grief because more than 100 journalists have been murdered in the last couple of years. No matter how many times we protested, I was in several protests, one in 2008 dubbed We Want to Be Alive, one right after the killing of Javier Valdez. Despite all our protests, the killing of journalists continue. I come here with more sadness than indignation. Mexico is one of the deadliest countries in the world for journalists. Yesterday, people gathered in Tijuana a city bordering the United States, for the funeral of reporter Lores Maldonado López, a well-known broadcast journalist who had already faced multiple attacks on her life when she was shot dead in front of her home Sunday. She was the third Mexican reporter killed in the first weeks of 2022. On January 17th, another Tijuana journalist, Margarito Martinez, was shot dead in front of his residence after he had just returned from an assignment. He covered police and crime and worked as a fixer for international media. On January 10th, the body of reporter José Luis Gamboa was found in the state of Veracruz after he was stabbed to death. The murder of Lourdes Maldonado has drawn widespread attention. She was reportedly enrolled in a protection program for journalists overseen by the Mexican government. She had a panic button in her house. In 2019, she went to a press briefing with the Mexican president, Andres Manuel López Obrador, and pleaded for his help. I am here asking for your support, for your help, and labor justice, because I fear for my life. I know that there's nothing I can do against the corruption I'm experiencing in Tijuana and with this powerful person without your support, Mr. President. That was 2019. This is Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador responding this week to the murder of Lourdes Maldonado. I wanted to address this murder, deplorable and painful, like many other cases, but this one in particular. We are going to investigate thoroughly. I'm saying this because yesterday there were reports that she was here, reports saying she went to the president asking for protection, and now look what happened, as if we dismissed her, as if we didn't care and left her without protection. This comes as Lourdes' dog refused to move from guarding the entrance to her home this week after she was killed. For more on the calls from Mexican authorities to investigate these killings and what should be done, we go to Tijuana to speak with Jan Albert Hudson. He's the Mexico correspondent for the Committee to Protect Journalists. He attended Lourdes' funeral yesterday. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Jan. This is a horrible loss for so many, not only in Mexico. Um, you were at the funeral. Can you describe it for us? You spent time with the family. Tell us who was there and what the family is demanding. Hi, thanks to be here. Uh, yes, I was yesterday at Lourdes' funeral here in Tijuana. Uh, it was a relatively small-scale event. I think there were about um, 40 people, and at least half of them were journalists. Uh, it's a big story here in Tijuana, because most of the journalists here in the city actually knew Lourdes. Uh, so for them, it was extra tragic. They had to gather at the, uh, the graveyard here in Tijuana and basically cover the murder of their own friend and colleague. Uh, the family of Lourdes was there. They were, uh, there were family members from the United States uh, who lived in San Diego, just across the border, and family members from here in Tijuana. Uh, they spoke briefly with the media, amongst uh, them myself, and uh, they were asking for justice. Uh, her brother said that they forgave the people who did this, and otherwise they are uh, very anxiously waiting for the Mexican authorities to provide them with an update about uh, what happened. And I think, uh, going back to your other question, what should be done, I think that's the first thing that should be done. Uh, authorities here in the state of Baja California need to provide clarity on who might be involved and what might be the motive behind this killing, because we don't know that uh, so far. So can you talk about the kind of reporting that she did, and also the fact that she had a panic button in her house? Sure. She uh, was a uh, online radio and television show host. She worked for a, stream a streaming uh, 
uh, provider called Sintonisa Sin Fronteras. And as such, she had several shows each week uh, in which it was her commenting on local events. Uh, she never pulled any punches. It was about politics, it was about crime and security, Tijuana being one of the most dangerous cities in Mexico right now. Uh, she also addressed the murder of her colleague Margarito Martinez one week earlier. And uh, according to the Baja California State Authorities, which I spoke with earlier this week, she was enrolled in a protection scheme uh, and she had a panic button at home in her house. Uh, but, you know, at 7 p.m. when she when she got back, when she was attacked, apparently she didn't have the panic button with her. And another thing that actually we need more clarity about is that the Baja California State Authorities told me that uh, she had poli regular police check-ins, meaning a patrol car would check in with her residence every once in a, in a while to, ch to see if she was okay. And apparently this wasn't enough, and they were not present at the time when she was attacked. Uh, so this means that whatever security measures the Mexican state had provided her, they've been uh, woefully insufficient. One of Lourdes Maldonado's last broadcasts was January 19th. It was dedicated to the Tijuana photojournalist, Jan, who you just mentioned, Margarito Martinez, who was assassinated outside his home last week. This is a clip of Lourdes on her own program, Brebaje, which means potion, paying homage to Margarito, not knowing she'd be killed days later herself. Margarito's death, his assassination, has left a big hole in journalism. He was recognized around the world for his work, reporting on the violence in Baja California, on the murders. He had tremendous knowledge on these issues. Jan Albert Hudson, you know, we, in addition to having you on, were trying to reach some Mexican journalists in Tijuana, but no one would come on, uh, fearful for what it could mean, how much danger they face. Um, can you talk about the danger they face and what this federal protection program is for journalists and why one is needed in Mexico, why it's one of the deadliest places in the world for media workers? Sure. Uh, I was actually yesterday at uh, the home of Margarito Martinez. Uh, I spoke with his wife uh, for, you know, quite a long time. Uh, the place where he was killed, it's, it's, very, it's very chilling. You walk up to her home and there's a spot, a very large spot, that was very clearly cleaned uh, with flowers and with candles uh, standing, standing right next to it, sort of like a silent witness to what happened to Margarito. And the kind of journalism that Margarito Martinez was special in was uh, the crime and security beat. Uh, what he did is he would uh, get up in the morning and listen to radio frequencies of the Tijuana uh, Municipal and State and the uh, Baja California State Police, as well as the Red Cross. And whenever an incident would come in, uh, Tijuana has on average five homicides a day, then he would uh, jump in his car and just go to the place where the, um, uh, the incident was reported, get out as soon as he can, take pictures, uh, uh, drive back home, and then upload those pictures to uh, one of the one or more of his many employers. And that particular kind of journalism is quite dangerous in Mexico and especially Tijuana uh, because it happens very often that when a journalist takes photos of these incidents, there might be someone there who doesn't like them to do it. For example, gang members or the family members of the, uh, uh, of the people who were killed, who were shot. And uh, journalists will be followed, they will be harassed by the police, uh, they might receive death threats. So it's, it's really a daily struggle for people like Margarito. And uh, one of the things that I think is very important and which I think the Mexican state needs to clarify is that Margarito actually got in touch with the federal mechanism for the protection of journalists and human rights defenders. That's an institution that functions under the, super, uh, the coordination of the Mexican federal government. It was created 10 years ago this year. Uh, and it is a small institution that's focused on coordinating protection efforts with state governments and with federal agencies. The problem with this mechanism is that it's woefully insufficient, it's highly centralized in Mexico City, it doesn't have any regional representation in Mexico, and even if it were, uh, if, even if it did have enough money, which it really doesn't because it's only working with a budget of approximately um, just over 15 million US dollars a year, uh, even if it had enough money, uh, and even if it had enough uh, 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 public officials working for it that were well trained, 
then there was still the issue of impunity, the issue of crimes not being properly investigated uh, by the Mexican authorities, which is what keeps incentivizing these killings. Uh, apologies for the background noise. I'm here in Tijuana, and there's, there's a little bit of a, a, a siren back there. Uh, we totally, now. we totally understand. Um, can you talk about the effect of the U.S.-backed so-called war on drugs, its rise in Mexico, and whether it is connected to violence against journalists and human rights defenders? There's a, a case of about five years ago, the murder of journalist Miroslava Breach in the northern Mexican state of Chihuahua. And in the years after she was murdered, she was a correspondent for national newspaper La Jornada. There have been numerous investigations into the circumstances of her death. And one of those investigations focused on the ballistic evidence uh, and the people who looked into that. Uh, they were able to link the murder weapon, uh, the, the, the pistol Miroslava Breach was killed with, directly to the United States. It was a gun that was bought across the border, uh, smuggled into Mexico, and then used for numerous crimes, including the murder of Miroslava Breach. Breach. Uh, in case of the murder of Margarito, uh, Baja California state authorities have already been able to link that gun to at least five crimes, and there's a very high probability that that gun, too, has been smuggled into Mexico uh, and then used by criminal gangs here. I think we cannot, uh, we cannot see the violence against journalists in Mexico as something independent from the war on drugs, because the numbers that at CP uh, that we have um, indicate that uh, the violence against journalists exploded just at a time when Mexico declared its U.S.-backed drug war against organized crime groups. Uh, the United States is a player in this violence, whether it likes it or not, because this is a transnational problem, and there's, we just have no other way than to, to view this, the war on drugs as probably the main factor that fuels this violence from a sort of transnational, international perspective. Finally, uh, USA Today um, reports the Mexican government estimates more than half a million guns are smuggled from the U.S. each year. Can you end on that note, Jan Albert? Absolutely. Uh, one of my colleagues, Joan Grillo, a British reporter here in Mexico, actually wrote a book about that called uh, The Iron River. And it's a phenomenon that is uh, apparently unstoppable. There are so many guns flowing southward. Uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of gun stores uh, just across the border. Uh, the ease with which uh, smugglers can buy guns in the United States and then smuggle them over the border to Mexico is staggering. And the current government under President López Obrador has actually been very vocal about the United States having to take measures against that. Um, I think it's a very tall order. It is a matter of, of bilateral uh, uh, cooperation. In the United States, uh, there isn't a lot of incentive cur currently to change it, you know, despite all the mass shootings in the U.S. But I don't think there's any other way than to, uh, to, to drop the violence, than to uh, at least address this issue in a bilateral sense. Well, Jan Albert Hudson, we want to thank you so much for being with us, Dutch journalist and Mexico correspondent at the Committee to Protect Journalists, speaking to us from Tijuana, where Lourdes Modenado was just memorialized at her funeral yesterday. She is one of three journalists to have been murdered in Mexico so far this year, in the first weeks of 2022.